Hey, Victor. Yeah. Hey, Kim. What's up? Did you know that past performance is not indicative of future results? I do. And I think our compliance department would definitely agree. And in today's podcast, we're going to say why. So we'll be sharing that with you. So stay tuned for an exciting new podcast on innovation. What will you do when your money works for you? Welcome to the Tech Girl Financial Podcast with your hosts, Victor and Kim Gaxiola. From the home office in California, here is Victor and Kim. All right, Kim, so we are back on the Tech Girl Financial Podcast, continuing our series this fourth season with talking about innovation. And that was probably the most teasery intro we've ever done. But it's an important subject because all along we've been talking about innovation. We've been fortunate to have some amazing guests kind of come and talk about uh, innovation in their areas of expertise, whether it's AI or growing a global network or, you know, the impact that Gen Z is bringing to the table. But what we really wanted to do is kind of bring it back to have a conversation about innovation and its direct correlation to investments. And so uh, we've done a little bit of research, and I know you've got some ideas to share. But what is the most exciting thing that's happening right now when you think about innovation, especially when it comes to people looking at making investments? Uh, And I want to start off by saying, again, ever the optimist here, I am so excited to be an investor and advisor today because of the rapid innovation and disruption that we see. And I want to compare it today to what what we didn't see because we we weren't alive back then, um, back when the Industrial Revolution happened and how, you know, innovation and inventions lead to other inventions, which can eventually lead to complete disruption. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that's a lot of what we're seeing today, which is what makes me excited about the future. There's definitely some parallels. And in looking at, as you mentioned, the Industrial Revolution, and we're looking at, let's say, the time period between the 1870s and the 1920s. And it was during this time, for those of you who are cracking open those history books, you might remember that it was in this era that railroads really took off, the invention of the automobile, electrification of manufacturing and businesses, and how the innovations and the development that were taking place in those industries really led and paved the way to even more powerful innovations when it came to science and manufacturing. So if you put yourselves in the timeline, late 1870s into the early 1920s and so, then you get into World War II, which accelerated, you know, in a time of crisis, Mm -hmm. a whole bunch of innovation in manufacturing because all of a sudden, you know, the United States and, uh, uh, you know, not just the United States, but all these countries were thrust into a war which forced the production of airplanes and tanks and artilleries and, you know, different things for the war, right? Right. Which, again, if you follow the evolution and you start seeing how innovation begets more innovation, is it was the rocket power that was, you know, created and developed over the course of the war effort in World War II, which led to the space race. And, you know, now you can look at the space race and its impact on technology and the improvements in computing power, right, Mm -hmm. and innovation for space, space travel and the development of of the space program. Right. So, Victor, have you ever, you've heard of the tequila effect, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I'm aware of the tequila effect. (laughs) But for those that are listening, let's share. What do you mean by the tequila effect? Where are you going with this, Kim? (laughs) Exactly. Are you just thirsty? (laughs) It's Friday, um, but it's only 11 a.m. in the morning, so we can't get started with happy hour yet. It's 5 um, o'clock somewhere. But as you know, you know, you can have one shot, two shot, three shots of tequila, and you're fine. You're sitting at that table hanging out with your friends or family, and you don't feel a thing. But, you know, fast forward an hour, maybe even two hours, you stand up because you're about to leave and you know sometimes it's a little harder to keep your balance right and you all of a sudden afterwards feel the effects that you probably thought you should have felt an hour or two before Mm -hmm. (laughs) and so that's what we're experiencing now is this tequila effect of the ongoing 
um, advances in innovation. Uh, the one big difference, I think, is that when we talk about the industrial age and we talk about the innovation that took place early in the 20th century or 19th into the 20th century, a lot of that was driven more by tangible, like physical. So we mm-hmm. talk railroads, we talk about engines, we talk about automobiles. But the recent innovations that we've seen tend to fall more in the cognitive side, right? right. The, the thinking side of things. And, and that's something we can't, we have a hard time putting a value to. Mm-hmm. You know, you can go and look at a factory and uh, appraise all the equipment there and come up with a number of how much capital is in that uh, building and why they should be, the company should be worth what they're worth. And, you know, add on some for growth and sales and revenues. Um, But it's a lot harder for us to understand why companies that um, invest massively in the cognitive space. So nowadays, cognitive skills are a little bit more difficult for us to figure out what the true value of that is. And cognitive skills also is what we what what the analysts like to call R and D. You know, what's the value of research and development? Mm-hmm. So that's a little bit harder to assess the value of, whereas tangible assets, you know, those things you can see, feel, hear, and equate to production lines and how much you can make and produce. And then your profit margins and all of that kind of stuff was a lot easier to, you know, figure out what a company is worth mm-hmm. over time. Now we have this human capital, which is, you know, not so easy to evaluate. How much are you going to spend in this area and what is it really going to give you in mm-hmm. return? Yeah. And I think going back to, you know, a lot of the uh, innovations that were taking place in the Industrial Revolution, like I said, were driven more by muscle and more driven by, you know, throwing more people at it or less people if things were advancing, let's say, in the agri- agricultural space. You know, throughout this whole season four, as we've talked about innovation, one of the th- one of the key themes around innovation is the acceleration. So even in talking about the valuation of something that's intangible, whether it's 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 um, intellectual capital or even in the in the equipment. So take, for example, let's say um, the acceleration power of a microchip transistor. You know, so computers still require you know, that microchip. And yes, microchips existed at the onset of computers, but what's happening, and this is all based on Moore's law, is not only the acceleration of its processing power, which allows, you know, a computer that used to have to fit in one room down to a box, down to a laptop, you know, now down to a smartphone. And with each acceleration, not only were you able to uh, have that processing power on a smaller hardware piece but that the processing power and acceleration of its speed of of processing has increased as well as the cost decreasing and so when you think about you know moore's law we're talking about a tangible piece that all computers need you know an actual piece Mm -hmm. but it improving over time um, both in its processing speed and also reduction in cost yeah, and I think that we're seeing that right now. You know, it goes back to the tequila effect and how it's relevant today is to say that I remember when the internet became a thing and we could all get online. And I remember when computers became um, something we could all buy. And that was great. And it did enhance our lives at that point in time. But we are not really seeing the massive disruption, or we didn't see the massive disruption back then. To our lives as we are seeing it still create and create even more disruption now than what we felt back then. Mm-hmm. And so that's really why I'm so excited right now. And I, you know, bringing it back to how hard it is for people to understand this, because if we were to translate what this means to our clients and people that invest in stocks and have no, you know, don't know what to invest in. Do they go and invest in a stable bank or do they invest in something that, you know, looks crazy and has already grown so much? And that, that's a really big, scary thing to do. You know, so we take it back and we say, is it too late to be invested in growth stocks and in innovative companies? Because we've already seen in this pandemic, how could they be higher than they were back in February 
before we realized that the country was going to go on lockdown or the world was going to go on lockdown. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I get this question all the time and I, I, I'm not going to give an answer on this, uh, on this, uh, on the show, but you know, Tesla, um, let's talk about a company that it's like, wow, is this stock has gone up and up and up and up. And so, you know, it's natural for us to all think, what's going to happen at some point that bubble is going to pop. And, um, we have a hard time explaining why it hasn't yet. And who's to say it, it still could pop. I don't have that crystal ball, but we have to have a reason to explain some of these companies that, um, have had the performance in the past. And, you know, I think a lot of us who were, um, looking at the stock market in the dot com bubble back in the late 1990s, are surely thinking because we have this, you know, somewhat this um, post-traumatic stress of what happened back then and thinking, when is this bubble going to pop now? And so, um, you know, that is why a lot of people are looking right now to alternatives such as value stocks, which in our world is just a way of saying, you know, where can we find cheaper stocks that haven't skyrocketed up in price? Mm -hmm. Well, and I think it goes back to how we started this podcast and saying that, you know, past performance is not indicative of future results. And I think the same thing applies when it comes to looking at developing an investment portfolio. So for in working with clients or working with people that are looking at uh, establishing an investment strategy, a big part of the conversation is not looking at companies or investments based on what they're currently offering. But more importantly, you know, where, where do we think it's going? Uh, what are these companies um uh, what kind of investments are they making in themselves in their research and development in the people that they hire and what kinds of problems will they be solving down the road and in the future? Because as we work with a number of clients, you know, and you think about developing a retirement portfolio, typically their greatest risk, or I would say their greatest fear is not having enough income once they do elect to retire and they're no longer working for a living and bringing in a steady paycheck. Are they going to be able to live the lifestyle that they envision for themselves based on the returns they're getting from their existing investments? Right. And traditionally, when you think about retiring, you think about how is your money going to work for you? That's my favorite line. You know, how do you get your money to work best for you so you don't have to go into a job anymore? And um, traditionally, that has been from dividends being paid by stocks or interest being paid by bonds. Um, that's a good way for people that are no longer working, getting that pay paycheck to get some income. Um, but I think that, you know, we also have it's very important, your component that you can be getting um, income by growth. Right. And that's not a traditional way of thinking that your portfolio is going to provide for you income when you're no longer working. But it is an essential piece of the portfolio. So I think a big I agree. And so I think it's an important question whether you're working with an advisor or not. But when it comes to looking at how you're going to complete your investment strategy and the specific companies that you're looking to invest, the big question for you is not only what can that company do, but what will it do? What, what, you know, so getting away from what's it designed to do and what can it actually do? Yeah. What it's going to deliver um, and down the road. And I think that that's an important question when it comes to looking at the companies that you invest in. Yeah, I think it's an important question for us to be asking in the kind of investments that we, we do recommend. Um, and it's important for us to keep an open mind because again, you know, I could say this over and over again, but what worked in the past may not work in the future. And what works now, you know, is probably not going to work 20 years from now. Mm -hmm. and, and I think a big part of that is, is it, it'd be easy for you to look at things that are, that are creating returns today mm -hmm. and maybe making the assumption that they're going to continue to produce results in the future, mm -hmm. right? Especially if it's a tangible product, something that you can actually see or touch or understand. And so there are some cautionary tales here when it comes to specific companies that weren't able to innovate fast enough to survive. So we want to share three mm -hmm. today, okay? So does anybody remember Kodak and the Kodak moment? I do. All right, so Kodak, as many of you know, photography, 
you know, as far as film and then the printing of film. And of course, this at its at, at its height in 1996, Kodak had a market value of around $30 billion. But unfortunately, the company was very slow to capitalize, specifically on digital technology and digital photography, uh, which it actually invented, which is the saddest part of this story, is Kodak invented digital technology, digital photography. They weren't able to convince the people to invest the research and development money. And unfortunately, it was displaced by the emergence of, guess what? The smartphone and digital. And photo sharing things like Instagram. And so guess what happened to Kodak? Bankruptcy in 2012. Uh, they, uh. <laughs> yeah, that's where you insert the <laughs> sad trombone, right? And we do remember those Kodak moments. And so it's a cautionary tale because I think it's important to think about what companies now are still clinging you know, to the way things have always been done and are not investing in innovation or un, are completely a, a, a unaware or they're not paying attention to the changes taking place in the marketplace specific to their customers to make the adjustments necessary to remain relevant. And that's so important today with the pandemic because that disparity between the haves and the have nots, even in the corporate world is getting bigger and bigger. And so those who had invested heavily in capital and creating those factories, manufacturing and are producing what they're producing, but haven't invested enough in research and development are really struggling to adapt to the way we're doing business now. And so it's almost like, you know, those disparities get larger and larger, Mm -hmm. which is a current theme of the pandemic, really. Right. And, you know, the other thing about the pandemic, which we discussed, is not only the acceleration, but I think it's actually the revealing of those organizations that are and have been nimble enough to make the changes. And what you see is the ones that have adopted to digital technology. So even things as uh, like restaurants. Okay, let's talk about restaurants for, just for a second here. And we'll go back to the sad trombone stories. But restaurants found themselves in a situation where they definitely couldn't keep people coming in because they couldn't. And, they, and especially if they had an indoor, they didn't have an outdoor setting. So what did they do? They very quickly pivoted into offering a delivery or working with those delivery companies that were app base that would be able to push their product or at least get their product delivered to people at home because people still wanted to eat, mm-hmm. you know, at Chipotle or they still wanted to eat at local restaurants or sushi and such. And so it accelerated that need, especially if they didn't have a solution to find a solution just to stay viable. So there is something to be said about innovation and that comes uh, as a result of disruption or getting your back up against the wall because nobody could have predicted the pandemic the way, at least to the extent that it's been. Mm-hmm. But we are seeing now, especially having been in it since March, the, the companies that have been nimble enough to make those changes to survive. And I think that that's, that's what we're going to continue seeing. Um, and the, the ones that are going to thrive after this outside of the technology companies have been the ones that have been able to embrace a tech solution that helps them deliver their product or service. Right. All right. So back to the sad trombone stories. Okay. The second one, which I think all of you may recall, is blockbuster video. So did everybody remember when there's like a blockbuster video always around the corner? I mean, I still even remember being able to rent the VCR. Um, But then again, so blockbuster video in the 1990s and early 2000s was all the rage. And they themselves innovated because it originally started with VHS and then they went to DVD. But what they couldn't have foreseen was the advent of streaming services. So this brick and mortar company really was no match, unfortunately, to the Netflix digital offering. And although they had peaked at $5 billion in 2004, they reached a point of no return and they also filed for bankruptcy in 2010. And that's another story. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Invested heavily in capital because they had to have uh, stores on, you know, in every city, in every town, and multiple cities or multiple stores in, in one town or big city. Um, and so you think about the amount of money that was spent there. And then you look at Netflix and, oh my gosh, you know, what a great business model. Everybody's going to stream from home we don't need any stores we just create content put it up there and 
it's subscription based. Yeah. And the thing is that Blockbuster actually had a physical product. I mean, right. they had the physical VHS tapes or the physical DVD. So if they had a Blockbuster movie, let's say at the time Batman, you know, came out, that they'd actually they, they couldn't just have one, right? Because somebody would come rent it, they'd they'd be rented every night and they couldn't have one. So when you would go to the store, especially when they had a new release, I remember you would have a whole rack. Mm -hmm. of the same movie over and over again. And sometimes they didn't have it, especially if it was a high demand thing. Right. But a store could carry easily 30, 40, or 50 copies of the same title. And actually, after they got their 49th or 50th person to rent it, that's it. They couldn't rent it anymore until somebody returned it. So I actually remember, and I'm going to date myself, but I do remember going to Blockbuster, walking in, looking around the shelves, finding the movie that you want to see, but they don't have it on, and they don't, didn't have it available. So you'd actually go to the counter to see if anybody had recently returned it. Mm -hmm. Do you remember that? Yeah. And then if somebody recently returned, if you were lucky enough that you'd be able to rent it. Now, even Netflix went through innovation in itself because you'll recall when we first started using Netflix, they would actually send us the physical DVD in the mail. I do remember that. And they had a really good system of, you know, sending the the, the DVD in the mail. You get it, put it in, watch it, and then you'd send it back in the same envelope. And so mm -hmm. it was kind of an exchange of DVD, still a physical product. Right. So still inventory controls on their end. I remember in those early days that Netflix started pushing their streaming service and we weren't streaming users. I, I don't think that the uh, the Internet was fast enough really to get a good picture. But more importantly, the Netflix content on their streaming service was horrible. They really <laughs> didn't have any good titles. And yet now it's the biggest biggest part of their business you know uh, I remember that day of making the decision that I no longer wanted to receive the DVDs and instead started doing the streaming and watching them online just because it became easier and so there there is no capacity issues when it comes to having to have to you know own multiple titles mm -hmm. because they can release content on day one and make it available to all their subscribers right and so ultimately you know everyone can be happy and you don't have this wasted inventory that um, is got a got a shelf life. Mm -hmm. All right, so you ready for the last and final sad trombone story? Yeah, I'm ready. All right, this one is one that really hurt, and and it hurt <laughs> because I loved going to this place. We're talking about Borders Bookstore. So Borders Bookstore uh, saw its price peak in 1997 before the economic innovation of, guess what? Amazon. And Amazon basically became the Earth's largest bookstore, and it started to assert its dominance in this landscape. And unfortunately, much like the two other sad trombone stories, Borders filed for bankruptcy in 2011. Mm -mm. So sad. <laughs> so sad. I, I used to love going there because right? it was books and it was music and you could browse and magazines and... They actually had the coffee shop inside. It was a place, to, a nice place to kind of hang out. Mm -hmm. And for a guy, you know, if you go shopping, in my case, when I'd go shopping with Kim and she wanted to spend some time, if there was a Borders, I could go park myself while she was shopping. And so I love the fact that I could be distracted and do my own thing while she was out shopping. Uh, but Borders is no more. I never made that connection. That's <laughs> well, why we don't go shopping together <laughs> anymore, right? Well, <laughs> You're too impatient. No borders. <laughs> mm-hmm. So when, you would talk, when we talk about Kodak, when you talk about Blockbuster, when we talk to, about Borders, I can't help but think, what are the current Kodaks? What are the current Blockbusters? What are the current Borders? What companies today exist that are at risk of displacement because of a better idea that comes through innovation or better research and development, understanding what the needs and wants are of its customer base? Right, and then going back to, you know... Um, investing 101, which is buy low, sell high. And so it's a it's a quest to find cheap companies, buy low. Even today, you know, I look at the stock market, I look, it's at a high elevated level. And so what can I find that's cheap? Um, but, you know, cheap isn't always a guarantee that it's going to get better. You know, it could get cheaper. It, it could go, it could become borders. Um, and so it's really important to not just be looking for cheap deals. And, and a lot of times that does have that, uh, you know, 
that connotation with value investing. And so you really need to look at what's going on right now and, and, and think differently. I think our job requires us to be open to change and really realize that there is change going on right now. And so what worked in the path, past may not work in the future. And so we really do have to be calculated about how we go about investing our clients' portfolios. With the big idea that we're still mindful of risk and um, how do we minimize that risk? And so it used to be the old ways are you minimize risk by um, buying some of those cheaper companies. And uh, sure, that 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 could be helpful. But um, if it goes out of business, then it's still a big risk. You can lose money. Mm -hmm. And so it's a balancing act. And, and, you know, I, I look at our jobs and, you know, what's the biggest difference between what we do and a CPA does, you know, it's that the CPA is looking at the history and we are looking at the future and that's our job. We, we, we don't have a crystal ball. I wish we did. It would make our jobs easier, Um, but there's always something difficult to do. Right. And our job is to look at where things are going. You can compare that to what happened in the past and, you know, put some context context to light in the whole situation. But our job really isn't that looking at what happened in the past, but what's going to happen in the future. So one of the greatest threats to actually investing in how we see the future going mm-hmm. is this are these behavioral biases that we have. Mm -hmm. And there's a couple of them here that probably hit us very close to home. You know, one is the dot-com bubble. And so investing in innovation is scary. Um, And even biotech, for for that matter, you know, there are times when biotech does really well, but there really hasn't been like a a dot-com era, I feel like, where we've really seen results from biotech. So it's scary knowing what's happened in the past and feeling like eventually, you know, that bubble is going to pop again. Mm -hmm. And, um, And so we think of technology companies, we think of biotech as high risk. And high risk is, you know... Um, Part of investing in a high risk is the, you know, possibility of high return. Otherwise, why would you ever go there? Mm -hmm. Right. And so that's something to think about. It's um, we we need to be mindful that we have these biases because that may hold us back of ever getting into those innovative companies because we feel they're too high priced. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, how do you do that? Um, So I think that that's a challenge for us all. And, you know, the, the other challenge uh, for me is this whole idea. You know, I love stats. I think it was one of my favorite classes in college. <laughs> I know I'm a geek, right? <laughs> um, and so I always think about mean reversion. Mm. You know, look at that bell curve and you, you've got to stay in the middle, right? And anytime you go on the outliers on the um, left side or the right side, you know, eventually it's going to get back into that mean reversion. And so I think that we um, intuitively think that about what we invest in as well and keep coming back to that area of, you know, we've got to get back to what history has told us will happen in the past. Mm -hmm. And now may not be the time. Right. Well, you know, I want to take it back to something that you've said in the past, especially as it relates to companies that are innovating or, you know, or, or some of these, you know, next level thinking organizations, especially under the side of, of innovation is this whole idea that even when it looks, looks at, you know, asset allocation, that perhaps innovation or disruption should be considered its own separate asset class. It's true. I I really like this idea of thinking about innovation and you know, massive disruption should be its own asset class. Mm-hmm. And this is why it's really hard for us to understand what these companies are truly worth because they have no real estate. Mm-hmm. They have no product. Mm-hmm. They have none of these things that we traditionally use to appraise companies. And, you know, going back even further, if we look at, you know, some of my favorite economists talk about this is this whole idea of, 
you know, what do the economic statistics tell us today? But but they're based on statistics we've been using for the past 50 to 100 years that are not telling the story. Because, you know, if we look and we say, you know, these companies are not investing in capital and we look at, you know, the GDP um, or, or, or corporations, you know, capital spend, and we're just not seeing the capital spend, the capital investment that we used to spend, that we used to see. But on the flip side, we're seeing consumers spending much more money. (laughs) And so, you know, some of the leading indicators that we've used in the past to tell us where our economy is going aren't working anymore because, of of this very situation yeah and specific to the uber story or lyft depending on what your preference is which always fascinates me is this whole idea of how quickly we as consumers were ready and able to adopt to this new model i mean it's that whole idea growing up in our you know gen x we were told never get in a car with a stranger now we're willingly getting (laughs) into a car with a stranger and actually paying them to, to take us from point A to point B. And all of it was driven by not only the innovation, but the safety and comfort that came with knowing, okay, I, there's no cash exchange. It's trackable. And so in that case, we placed so much more weight on the technology over the, you know, for the experience. Uh, it made me think, man, that taxi cab experience was really, really bad for right? me to get into a car with a stranger. I know. <laughs> well, don't get me started there. Do you remember when we went to the what was it, the John Hancock building and you and your dad wanted to pay your nephews a dollar for each yellow car they saw? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We we got up to the top of that building and all of a sudden they were going to make a lot of money because all you could see was yellow and re- yellow and orange uh, driving around downtown Chicago. And that was such a funny story because I think now, you know, where are, where is, where are the yellow and orange cars out there? (laughs) Well, actually it was, it was my sister who made the mistake. Um, and she had said orange taxi cabs because, or she had said orange cars or he had picked orange knowing, ah, there's no way he, you know, there's going to be that many orange cars out there. But uh, she didn't count for when you're in the John Hancock (laughs) building and you're looking down and you're going to see a lot of orange cars, but that wouldn't exist today. You know, from the standpoint, there's not as much inventory in that space. You say you don't have a crystal ball. I know you don't have a crystal ball, but if we were looking out towards the future and thinking, or at least anticipating which industries could potentially be right for disruption today, what would you say? Yeah. So I would say, um, definitely in biotech and the whole R and D, although I don't know how long it's going to take for them to, completely, you know, impact what we invest in. But I do believe that we need to be there um, because there's massive disruption happening in those companies. And we can see it with how quickly things are being done to create this vaccine for COVID. Um, The diversity of thought and technology and data scientists working with the human, you know, the health scientists to look at all this data we now have and be able to analyze it and and move forward and improve people's lives. So I think that that's a really big area that I am excited about. Um, I but I am also excited about you know the the age old technology and and technology being more specific. Are um, I think robotics and drones are really cool. They will save a lot of money in so many ways. I mean. You know, I have a friend at the water district. They used to have to rent helicopters to um, to do their, you know, surveying. And now they can do it in a drone. How much cheaper is that drone versus that helicopter? Um, I think that that's pretty cool what it's doing. I also think um, 3D printers have not gotten a lot of play. But wow, they're not only, you know, creating plastic goods and models, but, um, I think dentists are using them now for, um, you know, teeth implants, which are super expensive. So if you can get a 3d printer to do that, instead of spending 20,000, you're now looking at maybe 3000. I mean, I don't know if that's available right now, but that's a huge area that is, um, big, 
for health science, health science, as well as just production and manufacturing. I think that's amazing. Um, what else can we talk about? That's exciting. Well, I would say, you know, just in the acceleration of, you know, technology, especially during the time of the pandemic, two industries that have really come forward, I think that are ripe for innovation. So I agree with you on the healthcare space, Mm -hmm. definitely a need for that when, and more specifically, maybe biotech, but in looking at the impact that the pandemic has had in uh, how we live our lives, two areas. The first one I would say is real estate, mm-hmm. that I think real estate is definitely ripe for innovation and disruption as it relates to the entire process of uh, seeking a home, finding a home, buying a home, you know, and then securing a home. Or on the flip side, if you're looking to sell your home, um, I've often thought that it's perfect for a VR, you know, when it mm-hmm. comes to doing a virtual tour of an actual home. And I've seen some really good use of both drone as well as video technology and being able to display a home, especially in a time of pandemic, because uh, the real estate market has been very difficult to show and have open houses and things like that. And so realtors and real estate companies have been really smart about, okay, let's let's bring them in here on a tour with the video. You know, let's show them around and let's see how much of this we can handle uh, online, you know, in mm-hmm. the paperwork with e-docs and things like that. And be able to get through the disclosures and all the banking institutions. So I think real estate is right. one that's prime for disruption. And then the other one, which close, which is very close to home, is education. Mm-hmm. I think education is prime for disruption. And there has been an acceleration when you think about the use of Zoom uh, or you know video technology and the ability to be able to do this remote learning. As we've discovered, the pros and cons of both of the, of a remote mm-hmm. learning setting, because on one side. Con is obviously you're missing that social interaction. I think that that's very important, extremely important. Pro is you can do it anywhere you have a Wi-Fi connection. So whether mm-hmm. you want to do your classes here at home or go to Hawaii or end up in Florida, you can do it there too, you know? Right. So, so that, and that's at the primary, you know, secondary level. You know, when you look at colleges, there's some opportunities there as well. So two industries, I think, that are prime for, for disruption, and I think they've been tested throughout the pandemic. Right. And I, you know, I go back to that virtual reality, which does excite me a lot because of how that um, can go for policemen, for military and the ability to use those tools um, and stay safe, but gather intelligence where they need to gather that without the risk of their life. I think that that's phenomenal. And I'm really excited about, you know, what is happening out there and innovation in all of these areas. There's some we haven't even talked about, but we have talked about in other shows. So refer back to our library of good information and um, look at all that that um, we've talked about in this area. So put a big, huge bow on this entire episode. Can we go back, you know, where we end, where we began and saying that past performance is not indicative of future results and the underlying Part of that is future results. Are you innovating? Are you investing in companies that are innovating and moving where you want to be? Or are you blinded through your own biases, behavioral biases, in sticking with those companies that are proving short-term results but may not have long-term opportunity? Right. And so we want to be careful when we're talking about all this. We're very excited about it, but it is not the only place that we invest. Um, You know, very important is still asset allocation and, and diversification, and that plays into it. And also our tolerance for loss, right? (laughs) Because, um, you know, you can be the first to invent something and that doesn't guarantee that you will make it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think the point is that if you are working with someone and they're not, and you're not, they're not asking these questions or they're not answering these questions, you need to rethink who you're working with. Right. Our door is open. We are Tech Girl Financial. You can find us online at techgirlfinancial.com. We want to thank everybody for participating in today's podcast, as well as listening to the entire innovation series, which will continue for a few more shows. So we'll take this opportunity to invite you to uh, connect with us on any of our social profiles. And if you have any questions after listening to this, or if you'd like to schedule an appointment, you can send me an email at victor at techgirlfinancial.com. 
Thank you for being here. Yeah, we look forward to seeing you again soon. Take care. Bye. If you have questions, comments, or suggestions for future shows, please send an email to victor at techgirlfinancial.com or join the conversation on Twitter using the hashtag AskTGF. We also encourage you to follow us on the Tech Girl Financial page on Facebook and connect with us on LinkedIn. Securities offered through registered representatives of Cambridge Investment Research, Inc., a broker-dealer member FINRA, SIPC. Investment advisory services offered through Cambridge Investment Research Advisors, a registered investment advisor. Tech Girl Financial and Cambridge Investment Research, Inc. are not affiliated companies. Discussions in this show should not be construed as specific recommendations or investment advice. Always consult with your investment professional before making important investment decisions. Diversification and asset allocation strategies do not assure profit or protect against loss. Investing involves risk. Depending on the types of investments, there may be varying degrees of risk. Investors should be prepared to bear loss, including loss of principal.